Yes. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Yes, it's so good to see faces. <laughs> my name is Elena Campbell. I'm president of the Rochester Regional Chamber of Commerce. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the second in our four-part webinar series, Rebooting Your Business in Safe Mode. So we are attempting to guide you through the process of uh, doing what you need to do in order to reopen your business safely for your staff and your clients and of course the community at large. Uh, if you were on just a few minutes ago, you will have heard us discussing uh, a few of the uh, orders and some of the ambiguity uh, that is being experienced and we are so thrilled to have with us helping guide us through uh, the executive orders, I guess I'll say, and all of the rules and regulations. Brad Lambert with Lambert Law. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Brad, again, for being with us today. Lambert Law is one of our presenting uh, partners for this four-week series, as is CCS Presentation Systems. Matthew, give a wave. And Morning, everyone. We'll, yes, uh, we will hear from Matthew um, after the presentation today. I want to start out, first of all, by just giving a few announcements of what we have teed up for you this week. So, of course, today is our Rebooting Your Business in Safe Mode, uh, the second in our four-part series. And today, Brad is going to delve a little deeper into developing your PRP plan, which is your preparedness response plan. We have coming up this afternoon um, a webinar, Navigating CRE, the commercial real, commercial real estate during COVID-19. And we're thrilled to have Team Core provide us with some insight with regards to the current state of the market impact on tenants and building owners, some lease negotiation insight. You know, many of our uh, small businesses are probably trying to work with their landlords uh, on some lease negotiations. Um, and then they'll share with us some returning to the workplace and turning your business uh, back on. So we're excited about that this afternoon. On Wednesday, we will have our weekly member update call. We started holding these the very first week of the Stay Home, Stay Safe order. They are sponsored weekly by one of our 11 partners. Uh, tomorrow we will hear from First State Bank, who will provide some insight as to the COVID-19 resources they have available, and they'll introduce their new First State Bank CARES website which will be there to serve small businesses um, specifically. We'll also hear from our mayors, Mayor Bixon from the city of Rochester, Mayor Barnett from the city of Rochester Hills, uh, Christy Trevero from the DDA, uh, always provides a wonderful update on what's going on downtown. And then we will also hear from any of our other elected officials, which we um, usually have on the call from Senator Peter's office, uh, Congresswoman Slotkin's office, uh, Senator McMorrow's office, and Representative Weber's office. Um, last week, we were pleased to have Representative Weber join us virtually in person. They were not in, uh, in session, and so he was able to jump on the call himself. So it was great uh, to get an update uh, right from his mouth. Um, we will continue to do these weekly calls as long as it's necessary. Um, and then on Thursday, something really uh, to take note of, if you have received a PPP loan, the Paycheck Protection Program loan, uh, the Oakland Chamber Network, as part of their weekly small business town hall, will have uh, Leon Lebrecht and James LaPiccolo, who will present the hot off the press uh, rules from Treasury and the Small Business Administration with regards to the PPP loan. And what you need to be doing now uh, 
to ensure that you get the maximum loan forgiveness possible. So we're really excited about that. Leon and James are both uh, on the board of directors of the Michigan CPA Association. Leon is a longtime member of our Chamber of Commerce and a frequent speaker at a lot of our events. And he actually wrote the language on the state of Michigan's website regarding the PPP. So he is definitely an expert in this area. So if you have a PPP loan, this is a, a webinar that you definitely want to be part of. And that's Thursday at 1.30 p.m. And then the last thing that I wanna mention is something very exciting. And actually I see Maggie's on the call. I'll put her on the spot if she'd like to unmute and talk about the Back and Better campaign. Can you unmute, Maggie? Unmute. So, um, Michelle, our digital strategist, and I are very, very excited about our new Back and Better campaign. This is our reversal of the um, ribbon cutting procedure. Um, how it works is you contact me and we will, um, it's $40 for members, 50 for non-members, um, and we will drop off two pieces of ribbon and a yard sign that's gonna say back and better and it'll have the chamber logo on it. It is our version of retying the community back together. Um, so we'll take a photo when we drop off your sign and your ribbon. And then when you guys are ready to reopen your establishments, we want you to go out and have your staff members or um, someone be able to hold the two sides of the ribbon that are you know, tied together and, or uh, loose, and then you're gonna retie them. So um, it's, um, and then we're gonna uh, promote this through social media all over the place. So um, if you're interested, um, we uh, please contact me. I'll be able to walk you through everything that we're going to do. Um, I know that Fieldstone Winery is going to do it, and so is Tanya. So um, we're excited. They're going to be our prototypes for our new campaign. Um, we really wanted to do something with the community members. I know, Pat, you didn't know about it. It's all right. I talked to Ryan. Um, we wanted to do something with the community members um, in the businesses so that people knew they were open, but it to also to promote our togetherness as a community. So. Thank you, Maggie. We yes. are so, yeah, we are so excited about yeah. this. It's like that sign of hope, right? Um, yeah. To start to see businesses be able to reopen and we want to celebrate you and your reopening so contact Maggie uh, if you'd like to schedule one of these and like she said we will promote the heck out of it <laughs> that you are back and better than ever <laughs> yep. so so thank you so with that it is my pleasure now to turn it over to brad and i will stop sharing my screen and i will make you a co-host and you should now be able to share your screen okay all right you should see it up there is everybody seeing my uh my screen, the uh, opening screen. Does everybody see it? Yep. Okay, good. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, again for coming uh, this week to our second installment of our Rebooting Your Business in Safe Mode presentation. I'm Brad Lambert of Lambert Law. We have a law office on 6th Street right across from the uh, park in the Rochester City Hall, which I share with my son. He's my partner. I do uh, real estate business, employment law, uh, state planning and uh, in litigation in those areas. And today, of course, we're dealing with the, uh, the very real uh, employment and business law aspects of, uh, of the governor's various executive orders regarding COVID-19. And I'm gonna get right into it, but, I, but before I do, I'm gonna tell you that I am gonna have uh, a actual medium risk business plan, uh, preparedness plan on, online after this presentation. 
And also this particular presentation will be available on my LinkedIn pages, my website eventually, uh, hopefully later today. Uh, LinkedIn should be right away. And then I believe Elaine is gonna be making it available on the Chamber site as well. So with that, let's get to uh, the new orders. We have a new orders in town. We have new executive orders 91 and 92 that literally just came out yesterday. So frankly, I'm still digesting them, but I think I've got the gist of it. Uh, it does continue a lot of what you've seen in Executive Order 77, except now we've divided them up into two separate orders, and there's very specific reasons for that, which I'll get into. We'll also be dealing with the contact standard, returning to work, and the enforcement protocol where there is literally a new sheriff in town. She has deputized the administrative agencies to get back in the business of doing this kind of work. This is a list of our relevant authorities we'll be dealing with. And Executive Order 36 is still in place. It protects employees who are being uh, not allowed to work or even being sent home uh, against their will with regard to COVID-19. And the various orders that I'm gonna be talking about. I'm not gonna be talking a lot about the other general legal authorities today because frankly, we got a lot on our plate uh, with, with respect to the, uh, the preparedness plan. And I thought, for purposes of talking about a preparedness plan, I really needed to draft one myself. I've worked off a couple of models, but drafting one myself was definitely a learning experience with respect to this. And I found it to be my own personal visit to uh, Wonderland. Uh, there is definitely a lot of particular details and other uh, picayune matters, which frankly, uh, many small and medium businesses aren't used to dealing with. You're, you're entering the the world of OSHA on steroids. Uh, because now I find myself when I'm drafting this, I'm literally telling people where to sit, where to stand, how to walk down the hall, uh, where you're gonna be when you're, uh, when you're getting tested. It, it's an amazing amount of detail that's going into these plans uh, in dictating exactly where everybody's got to be uh, with respect to uh, the preparedness plan. I'm sure there are certain facilities like laboratories and and other uh, sensitive uh, government facilities, which are, are used to this, but most of us are not. And frankly, this is a significant expansion of the OSHA, OSHA protocol into all sizes of businesses. Normally a business with less than 10 employees is not dealing with this sort of thing, uh, or even 50 employees for that matter in a lot of cases. Now, executive order 20, 202091 is very specific about what has to be in this plan. And frankly, I, I found it interesting that she should supplanted the OSHA guidance to, and the, even the CDC guidance in some respect to, to some degree, which she had not done before. Um, and I think the critical item, which is my bullet point number two that you need to have, I call the plan director because to my mind, the point person you're going to appoint acts much like a, uh, a movie director. He or she is telling people where to be, like I told you, where to be, where to stand, where things are going to be organized. Uh, you're going to have something like Elena's uh, uh, a board out on the Candyland board out on the, on the lawn, something like that to have people when they have to be in line to where they got to be. So you really are acting a lot like a, uh, a director. I adopted that term before she came out with her term yesterday, calling it a supervisor. I'm staying with director. You still have to uh, have the daily screenings. And again, this is where some of these uh, worksite controls, ground markings are gonna take place that you need to keep people six feet apart because they're gonna be there for a substantial amount of time if they're entering the workplace and there's a line. Uh, and, and before you do any of this, going back to my third bullet point, you really need to tell the employees, okay, you're working remotely, you're working here at the office, at the worksite, or you're a combination of the two. There are three, basically three choices that you have to inform each employee as to uh, before you really even get them into the plan. And then the bottom two uh, bullet points are new in Executive Order 91. Uh, now there are employee training requirements, which I'll get into a little bit. And there's also seven separate categories, which was a little frustrating for me because I was hoping to give you a comprehensive uh, PRP but unfortunately, because there are seven separate categories that require distinct terms for each of the seven categories from paragraphs two through eight of uh, Executive Order 2020-91, uh, we're gonna have to customize them to that degree. And the, the plan form that I'm putting out there will allow for that, but it has to be added. 
Now, the big question that comes up in these plans is PPE. And you basically, yes, you do have to choose your rabbit hole. What, uh, what kind of PPE do I need for my employees who are, who are coming into the work site? We're now dealing with people in the work site. Obviously, you're not, uh, you're not that engaged with respect to uh, when they're at home. Uh, and I, I really look at this as a sliding scale, pretty much. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but outside and inside are where we start. For outside work, almost always, there will be no need for masks, uh, except when you get into close contact. So it's really more interesting to talk about the exception than the rule, because outside work, you generally can stay more than six feet away from each other. There's a lot less risk. The, the ventilation problems are obviously uh, non-existent. And you will rarely need um, masks for outside work. If there is some station outside where people are coming within six feet of somebody who's placed in the station, then yes, you better consider whether that employee should have a mask or even more uh, stringent uh, controls. Other than that, outside you're fine. And the same is true for inside when, and this is the term of art they're adopting or the governor's adopting, public space. Inside work, you're also fine without a mask if you're not in a quote unquote public space. The best example I can give of that is um, where somebody's individual office. If you, if you have your own office and people are sitting across from the desk on a intermittent basis, maybe two, three times a day, and there might be a couple people there, you're probably not in a public space. You probably don't need to have a mask. If you got three or four people coming in, you've probably just converted your office to a public space, and then you have to think about masks. So you really have to make these distinctions. And unfortunately, they're, uh, they're on the go and they're uh, frequent. Uh, so you gotta make sure that you uh, uh, have done just that in terms of making, making the decisions on the run. And again, I think using the plan director for those purposes, that's a perfect thing for, to get some guidance from the plan director on, particularly with respect to the record keeping requirements that are, that are gonna be in place. Now, as you see on the second major bullet point, masks are indicated when you cannot consistently, and this is, this is the literal term that's being used in the order, you cannot consistently maintain six feet of separation or you're in a public space. Plus, with respect to masks, and I'm gonna get into the uh, contact issues in, in another slide, but essentially you should, as a business that has an inside operation, be prepared to offer masks to everybody who enters the space. Uh, it's almost a matter of courtesy, but it's certainly a matter of legality with respect to the governor's order. As I mentioned, there are areas where you don't need to have masks, but you, you should probably start with the assumption that the person entering your business should get a mask. Now, when we get into the more serious um, guidelines regarding barriers and face shields, essentially what we're seeing is uh, three feet. That, that seems to be recurring in the governor's order 91, that if somebody cannot consistently maintain a, a space of three feet from somebody, then you have to start thinking about those shields that you see online where it's a shield sticking up and the most frequent incurrence that we've all seen are the grocery stores where the grocery clerks have the, uh, uh, the shields in front, but that's not the only place I've seen it or that any of us will see it. Uh, you have to think about that when, when there's going to be three feet of, uh, of separation or less on a regular basis. And also when you're in a quote unquote public space, it can even be an open space where people are just naturally, quite naturally, going to be within three feet of each other. The, um, we'll move to our next slide. Now the cleaning measures, uh, my... I'm not gonna get a lot into the detail on the cleaning measures, but obviously door handles, frequently touched surfaces, office equipment, these should be, these should be cleaned probably at least once or twice a day. Uh, and the best practice is to follow the CDC guidance as closely as possible. I'm gonna be providing that guidance and it has some very specific uh, rules about using disinfectants, cleaning, using gloves when you're cleaning, you should be affording gloves to the employees who are doing the cleaning. Uh, that is all spelled out in the CDC guidance. And I, my, my recommendation is, you know, deputize your employees. If they have a workstation, they should be responsible for cleaning it. You should also have other people who are responsible through the, through the director 
to clean the spaces that are more public and for example a, a community copier that more than one person uses you want to make sure that that's getting cleaned on a regular basis that's where a lot of the contact spots are and you should be providing a hand sanitizer according to the guidance we've been getting now the safety measures that have to be in the the plan are spelled out here on this particular slide uh, there's not much specific guidance in the EO, so we really are going more with the uh, CDC guidance in this particular area. And I don't have to go over it a whole lot. I mean, obviously, the, the, the key element comes up when you have positive symptoms or testing uh, of an employee, then you instantly have to go to the isolation or quarantine measures that are spelled out in the CDC guidance and get the employee out of here. And it gets a little tricky. I'm not going to get I'm not going to get into HIPAA a whole lot, other than to say that. The guidances and the orders indicate that you're not supposed to be publicly identifying the employees uh, throughout. Am I, is everybody still hearing me all right? I'm not getting the, please wave or not. Everybody still yeah. hears me fine? Okay. You're good. Yes, fine. we're hearing. You're good. Okay. okay. I wasn't getting the feedback there, so I, so I wasn't sure. But uh, to, just to make sure, you want to isolate and quarantine them. And you certainly want to notify people who had the close contact. And, and to me, it's going to be a, a, a dramatically difficult juggling act to say that, were you close to employee A who I can't identify to you? It seems to me that if you, need, if you have suspicions that somebody was in close contact with an infected employee, you have little choice but to identify the employee. How, how in the world are they supposed to answer if you do not? Uh, so I, I believe, without guidance, I believe in those instances, yes, you are free to identify the employee because you're doing so for the more paramount objective of, of protecting the other employees. And then the, uh, the PRP will also provide for the fact that employees must self-monitor and report when they see unsafe practices and when they are having, uh, they're experiencing their own COVID-19 symptoms, even apart from the daily screenings which are taking place. Now, this is where we get into the trickiness of the whole six feet, uh, <laughs> the six feet proximity. Frankly, I think proximity, unless you've got you know, like two people in an 800 square foot office, the six foot proximity is, is virtually inevitable. I, I, it cannot be avoided. And thankfully, the orders and the guidances do not require that it be completely avoided. Uh, what I see as a potential, potential danger here is that people will overreact oh my gosh, I just brushed by somebody. You know, I, I guess I gotta go home now. No, that is what I would call now, and again, this is my term, not, not the order's term. I would call that incidental contact. And incidental contact is fine. You don't have to worry about it. Matter of fact, there's been guidances out there that suggest you can be in contact with somebody for up to 10 minutes. I wouldn't use that standard now, but the, the term 10 minutes has literally been used. Uh, Executive Order 2020, 92 and 91, state variance standards, mainly 91, to the maximum extent possible, you have to keep distance, you have to avoid close contact, and you have to consistently maintain six feet of separation. You see those terms alternatively throughout the orders. So it's the job of the plan director and the business owner to try to maintain that kind of order out of chaos to the extent you can. But please do not overreact. We do not have to keep everybody six feet apart at all times. There's no Michelin man standard here. And I, I guess I would liken it to the NBA. Anybody who's watched NBA games knows the term incidental contact. If Dwayne Wade gets knocked down or if Detroit Piston gets knocked down, that's incidental contact and there's no foul. If LeBron James gets knocked down, well, that's a one-way ticket to the free throw line. So that's an illustration of how difficult it is to uh, determine what is close contact and what is incidental contact. Now, in terms of return to work, I'm not going to deal with this a whole lot because, uh, it, it, you know, frankly, it's not all that interesting. It's pretty cut and dry. You basically have a, uh, a few con contact points that you've got to pay attention to. If you've got a test, obviously, if you've got a negative result from a test, yeah, the, the person can work. Uh, there, are, there are very specific terms with regard to um, when you, you can return uh, after you've had a positive test, and some of those are spelled out there. I think the trickiest one, the one that actually is going to be a little interesting is when you're dealing with quote unquote close contact with an infested person, because again, you're going to have the whole brush by type of incidental contact reporting. And 
I think it's incumbent on the employer to really probe into that. Gosh, I was close to this person. It turns out they had uh, COVID-19. Well, okay, uh, you know, let's get into some details. Let, let's find out how close you were and for how long. And that's going to require some, you know, tricky judgment calls. I would err on the side of sending the person home, given the uh, current environment. That may change. But uh, you got to really probe a little bit and, and not just accept the fact that somebody was within six feet of somebody for a couple seconds, particularly if it was outside. you got to take all those factors into account. And now we're going to get a little bit into strategy here. I'm sure all of you see the red queen on the screen and you think I'm referring to a certain someone. I am not because the chances that Governor Whitmer is going to come to your personal facility and decide whether you're in compliance are a pretty close number to zero. What you're going to be dealing with is an army of red queens and they're going to want to know if you're in compliance. We're dealing, as you've already seen, we're dealing with a lot of, uh, a lot of vague terms here that can have a lot of meanings to a lot of different people. And now in Order 91, she's made it what I consider an interesting move and probably clever from her standpoint. Up until now, these have been executive orders that have been strictly, uh, strictly enforceable by the, uh, the governor herself and strictly drawn by the governor herself. And the penalty has been criminal sanction. Well, guess who enforces criminal sanction? The local police, not the administrative agencies up in Lansing. So she's learning. And she found out from Owasso, and of course she found out from Wisconsin with the order that came through, that that's not such a good way to go if you really want your orders to be enforced. Because you're dealing with agencies who number one, are unfamiliar with enforcing these sort of things. And number two, do not share the same commitment to these kinds of standards, which are typically handled by administrative agencies. There, there's, just a, there's just a disconnect there, which isn't necessarily devious or, or uh, you know, a, a denial of uh, authority at all. So now what we've, we're, we're into a new stage as of today. We are into a new stage where the administrative agencies are going to be coming straight and forward front and, front and center here in terms of becoming the Red Queens who are enforcing this. And yes, there's a lot of room here for a lot of after the fact rulings, which aren't supposed to happen. They're supposed to look at this with respect to the standards that you're aware of at the time, not, not after the fact. But my concern for business owners is that's exactly what's going to happen. Well, of course it was this way. Well, I had no notice of that. In, under American system of law, you're supposed to have notice of what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to know the law and not have the red queen come forward and tell you this is what you should have done with, with the advantage of hindsight. I see a lot of potential for that happening here. We gotta be careful about that. So really dividing this up into the two orders is the governor's responsive strategy. This is what she's doing. She's essentially saying, okay, my order 92, which is essentially, and you know, someday we'll be talking about order 175, but right now it's order 92. This is the one that still has the criminal sanction. This is the open close order. What she's, and, and that's where she's on shaky legal ground. You know, I think we all know that this is a rather unprecedented time where governors are actually closing businesses. It's not a clear standard for them that they can even do that. And, and I think in, we'll be seeing some court rulings, including the one we saw in Wisconsin, down the line as to whether they can do that or not. There will be some pairing back. There may be some invalidating. We don't know. But we know that this is not the governor's normal wheelhouse. Executive Order 91 is where she is eventually, she's essentially taking out the area she's most familiar with, health and safety. Her authority in the health and safety area is clear. That's what states are for. Matter of fact, even the feds are supposed to kind of stay out of that area, even though they, <laughs> they have not resisted that temptation. Uh, so the governor has clear authority to, and the state, state government for that matter, including the administrative agencies, have clear authority to get in health, safety, and welfare. It's a different area, and it was, it was probably uh, clever of them, frankly, like I said before, to divide them up into these two categories. Because now the enforcement mechanism for 91 is no longer the criminal law, but is administrative law, which will be administered by the, uh, by the administrative agencies, Leo, Laura, whatever they call themselves, OSHA, Michigan OSHA. These agencies, which are familiar with doing this kind of activity, will now be the ones who are deputized to enforce Order 91. And I'm going to read for you paragraph 11 in Order 91, because this tells you a lot about where we're going with this particular order. 
any business or operation <clears throat> that violates the rules in sections one through nine, those are the rules preceding the general clauses, those are the ones I've been talking about, has failed to provide a place of employment that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death and serious physical harm to an employee within the meaning of the Michigan Occupational Safety and Health Act, MCLA 408-1011. So what that creates is almost an automatic violation. Frankly, I think that goes too far. That's my personal opinion, don't count on it. I think there should have been a rebuttable presumption uh, because obviously if you fail to properly document the comings and goings of an employee on June 2nd, uh, that's hardly cause for you know, shutting a business down. Uh, however, this particular clause would actually suggest that sort of thing. And I know a lot of us out there are, are sitting there thinking, well, all this is gonna go away. You know, the, eventually they're gonna get this to the Michigan Supreme Court and there's eventually gonna be a pairing back or whatever. Well, I don't think that's gonna happen with Order 91 and however it's, it developed because for the reasons I just stated, this is health and safety. They've divided it out. Yes, the courts may very well come back and say, ah, you couldn't really, eh, you sh shouldn't have shut the business quite like that. And maybe you should have carved it back a little bit, whatever they might say. But it's less likely that that kind of activity is gonna go on with respect to the health and safety measures. So when you are reopening, do not assume that all this is going away. Record keeping is gonna be very important. As a matter of fact, paragraph nine specifically requires the record keeping that I've listed here. All your training efforts, all your screening efforts, and all your reporting of cases have to be specifically recorded pursuant to Order 91. And frankly, I think that particular requirement will stand even, even under court um, scrutiny. Uh, and then we still have a couple weeks left, so we'll be dealing with this as it develops. Here are essentially the uh, items we'll be covering. We had to push back a few of these items that we might have covered this week because there's so much in Orders 91 and 92. And a little, uh, information on us. Again, these are the uh, legal areas we cover. My son does personal injury alone. I do not. And I do all these other areas along with him at our office uh, on 6th Street. And I have provided in this uh, the cited authorities that we've been talking about as a bibliography uh, for your usage when we do post uh, this particular uh, slideshow. And that concludes my presentation, Elena. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brad. We have a few questions in the chat box. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box and we will make sure to ask Brad, who we are assuming can answer these questions and I know some of them, uh, you know, you maybe can't, but you can give us guidance, uh, perhaps. So the first question is from a workout facility. If you have an establishment that is not open to the public, but you have members, so only members come to the establishment, would you need to require the members to wear the mask if there's ample room inside the establishment? Generally, no. I do not believe you would need to do that for the reasons I stated. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about shared equipment in that, in that setting. You'd have to take, uh, I, I think your challenge is going to be more in the area of cleaning than the masks. Uh, and you're just going to have to keep an eye on it. If, it. if it turns out that people are, again, the, the magic six foot standard, if people are uh, continually uh, unable to maintain six feet of separation, that's not their problem in your store as much as it is in your facility, as much as it is your problem. And then you're gonna to have to take measures and perhaps bring masks, but generally no, that would not be my starting point. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, another question. Um, if we are wearing face shields, do you have to wear a mask as well? That's not my understanding, no. I, I, that seems redundant to me just from a physical standpoint. And I've certainly seen nothing in the guidances. I mean, to me, the, the way it's been presented is alternatively, you wear a face mask or you wear a shield. And oddly enough, and, and, and actually it's kind of helpful, this six foot, three foot dichotomy seems to be kicking in. And if it's a six foot separation problem, I'll call it a problem, you can't maintain six feet is what I mean, then you're dealing with masks. If you're, if you're down to three feet, then you're, you get more into the face shields and the barriers. 
That's the way it seems to be playing out. And I do not see the need for both uh, simultaneously. So up to the business, if they want to do that. I did notice in the actual wording, it says, when employees cannot consistently maintain three feet of separation from other individuals in the workplace, they should consider wearing face shields. Yeah, consider. Uh, Again, you have to really read the words and what they say. Yeah. Is it mandated or not mandated? I agree. Uh, that is a classic, what we call, I'm sure you've heard the term, weasel word. <laughs> and I, my, my concern, uh, as I sit in this chair, I might handle it differently if it's my business, but as I sit in this chair as an advisor, I, I'm very concerned about consider be, becoming something a lot more stronger than consider. And it's going to be a facts and circumstances situation. If, if, it's, if it's something that's occurring three times a day, then you probably don't have a problem. If it's something that's occurring a dozen, two dozen times a day, then consider kind of goes out the window. Okay. Another question. Without a three foot consistent separation, does that require a face shield or barrier or both? So she says, we have secured face shields for my salon employees, but to date only a plastic barrier is in place for the front desk. That sounds good to me. It really does. I mean, I, I think that's functional. Uh, and, and you don't have to be uniform. If I understand the question, it seems like you don't have to be uniform throughout the store. Uh, a, a shield certainly makes sense at the front desk versus, you know, I don't know how you would shield a, a salon worker uh, with, a, with a literal barrier. Um, the face shield would make a lot more sense at that stage. Right. Um... A uh, good point. Tanya Karsten has a good point. They're choosing to wear face shields in the tea room, assuming that they're within six feet. They're a pretty small area of space. Um, so again, you can choose for your business how far you want to go and what level of comfort, right, for your employees and your um, patrons that, that yes. you want to provide. Um, another question, you stated, prepare to offer masks to those entering. I understand providing masks for employees, but are you saying businesses should be prepared to offer masks to customers? Yes. Yes. That's what it says. So that's what the actual executive order says. Yes. Do we have some more questions? Well, let me qualify oh, that. Ahead. Yeah, let me qualify that. It, it, it would not be necessary. For example, um, I'll pick on Mike Brow at, uh, at his store there on Main Street. Um, if Mike's only got you know, a couple people in the store, then that's much less of an imperative. Whereas if he's got, or even Sanders, we can pick on Sanders if you like too. Whereas if Sanders is consistently having, you know, 10, 12 people, or Mike is consistently having 12, 10, 12 people in the store. I think it's far more imperative at that point to, to present the uh, masks uh, than, than otherwise. But the order literally does say you've got to be ready to, uh, per, per, to, to make, offer them to people that are coming in the store. It does say that. I just think as a practical matter, as this thing unwinds, you're going to see a difference depending upon the volume of people in a facility at any one time. Okay, um, so how would this apply, say, in a physical or occupational therapy or child development program that works one-on-one -on -one with a client? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm sure that facility is probably aware that the, all the guidances indicate that you do not put a face mask on somebody two years old or younger. And then in terms of how you you know, first of all, I would not repeat the mask. I would not say, okay, here's customer one. I'm giving them the mask. Oh, well, customer one's done with the mask. Okay, here you go. You're going to get, I think this is common sense, but I want to make sure. You need to have the disposable mask at your, uh, at your command. Um, what other details do you think that question is looking for? 
Well, I have another question that piggybacks on that. Can you deny entry in a store without a mask? Oh yeah, it's your store. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's your store. The only concern there would be if you're, uh, you're, you're discriminating on the basis of, um, of, of categories that are obviously illegal, such as race, sex, age, um, if, if the pattern is developing where you're, for example, age would be one that actually makes a little sense but can't be done, you might say, hey, I'm, I'm just not letting people in that are over age 75 because I'm concerned about the liability. Uh, you're, you're probably not allowed to do that. Uh, so you've got to be careful in terms of when you do keep, turn people away that you're not doing it, that you're not appearing, and I, I know you're not going to do it, but that you're not appearing to do it on the basis of some uh, illegal classification. Brad, did you, is it, I'm not sure, I didn't confirm this, but I had heard that Menards was not going to allow children to be brought into the store. I haven't heard anything. Okay, I haven't confirmed it yet, but uh, I haven't had time to delve into it, but I had seen something on Facebook that wow. Menards was not going to allow people to bring children in. What would your take be on legally on that? I, you know, they're really not a protected category. Uh, I mean, there's age, age discrimination is normally applied for people who are over 40 years of age. Uh, so that um, I, my, my general take on that is that it probably, it's their facility and that is not an illegal basis upon which to deny entry. Okay. Generally speaking, I, I, I can't, I'm not saying that with complete confidence, obviously, but, you know, applying the legal standard, uh, you know, you, you are in fact free to, to discriminate against children for the most part. Another question, um, if when we are able to reopen our office, we only allow employees to enter the space, we have workstations that keep everyone more than six feet apart, am I understanding correctly that masks would not be required? Yes. Okay, what if customers decline if we offer a mask? then it is up to us to allow them to come in. Should I designate a no mask area, kind of like a smoking area? Good question. Oh, that's clever. Smoking, uh, non-smoking masks and non-masks. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is where we're going, folks. Yeah, talk about Wonderland right here. We're down the rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, I, I would... I think that's a clever solution uh, because you, you do have, you know, obviously you've got people all the way across the spectrum on the mass situation. Some think it's just absolutely ridiculous and some think that it's imperative and you've got all points in between. And, and people that, wear them in their cars. Yes. So that's going to be a challenge for the typical facility or business owner to deal with, uh, certainly in the short term. And yeah, I, I like that solution because you really, I, I have yet to see any guidance from the governor saying that you have to deny entry to a person who is uh, not wearing a mask. I mean, yes, paragraph 15 of order 77 indicates that, um, uh, that you know, everybody that's in, in, in an enclosed, in a public place, or excuse me, public space has to wear a mask. I mean, that's, that was in, in order 77. I've, I've not updated that with respect to Order 91, but I expect that that same sort of uh, thing is there. As a matter of fact, if you like, I can I can take a quick look at that while we're uh, while Matthew's talking and, and maybe get back on that question. And I was planning yeah. to I was planning to have something for them to sign saying I'm declining a mask. Excellent idea. Excellent idea. Because that's going to be part of your record keeping requirements. Folks, the more you keep records on all of this, the better off you're going to be against any, any action that's taken. Because like any regulatory action, it's much like getting audited by the IRS. We, we all know that we don't get audited. By, everybody does not get audited by the IRS. Same thing's going to happen here. Everybody's not going to get audited on their, on their compliance measures. But you got to be ready to be audited because it can happen. Okay. 
Um, here's another question. We have two tenant businesses in our building. We are planning on amending their lease agreements to include this reopening plan. Currently, we have four cameras at our office. What would be a proper statement if we find out they're not following the new procedures? Well, the, uh, I would give, I would treat that as a notice of default and um, a chance to cure. I would, under most leases, that would, that would seem to me to be the kind of, most leases I'm familiar with, and I've looked at thousands of them, <laughs> I have to confess, uh, most leases I've seen would treat that as something where the, the landlord does give the notice, say you are out of, give, give reasonable detail as to why you think they're out of compliance, obviously. And then you give them some period to get back in compliance uh, or, or other measures will be taken. And you do have a number of default measures up to uh, evicting them from the premises, obviously. Uh, but I would think typically there would be a fine protocol. They probably, most spaces like that probably have rules and regulations that enable a fine protocol, uh, monetary fine uh, in that situation. And I would, I would guess that that would be uh, something that would be added into that particular procedure. Okay. And another question, while photographing clients in studio or on location, are you required to still offer masks? Also, will adding a clause of no liability to the basic contract when working with clients suffice for legal purposes should a client contract COVID and tries to contact trace it to your business? So two questions. When photographing clients in studio or on location, are you required to still offer masks? On location? I want to make or sure. on location, in studio or on location. Well, okay, the, the two different things. Clearly in studio, you, you would have the requirement. On location, uh, you don't control that space. So whoever controls the space, unless it's outdoors, um, I, I can't see where you would be uh, required to, to uh, somebody else may be required, but not you. Okay, and then the second part, well, adding a clause of no liability to the basic contract when working with clients suffice for legal purposes, should a client contract COVID and try to contact, contact trace it back to your business? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's one I really can't answer um, directly as I sit here. Uh, it, it seems to me it's, it, that's getting... All I can do is give a little, and that's all I'm doing anyway. I'm obviously not giving direct legal advice here in the manner of an attorney-client privilege, I'm giving information. But I would say that generally speaking, I, I would see um, that being pretty close to the disclaimers that you find on the base, back of your tickets when you go to a baseball or football game. Um, and really, I don't know the answer to that, how that would play out. This is an entirely new area, which we'll borrow from uh, precedents like the disclaimers on, on event tickets, but nonetheless, it is a new, new kind of area. Okay, um, as part of our job responsibilities, we have to visit public school sites. Do they fall under the definition of a public space, even if the building is empty or has limited occupancy when we are present? Let's look at the definition of a public space. A public space is a social space that is generally open and accessible to people. Roads, public squares, parks, and beaches are typically co considered public space. However, I understand the school is open to people, but it's not open to people when they're doing their work. So I would say, no, that is not a public space, and I do not believe a mask would be required. Okay, and then Clarifying your earlier response, landlords can install cameras to ensure a leasing business are following the safety guidelines and if not, can hold the lessee in default? Um, if you have properly adopted the regulations, I'm not sure you're gonna get away with a lease. You know, I, I can't opine on that. I'm not sure you're gonna get away with a lease amendment. Uh, I, I, you know, personally, and this is just my personal preference, I see it more as a regulation type of uh, rules and regulations type of uh, enactment 
Uh, and then the question is whether the rules and relate regulations are quote unquote reasonable. I think there's a good argument to be made there are, that they are under these current circumstances. Um, if your rules and regulations are reasonable and they're being violated without, without any, um, without any uh, you know, effort to correct the violations, then yes, you have the potentiality for declaring a default. What I'm not doing is giving a legal opinion saying, oh yeah, you've got a slam dunk in court. I'm not going that far. But I'm saying that is the protocol you would follow. Okay. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Uh, oh, one more. As a fitness studio, my members signed an initial waiver prior to working out. I have now added a COVID-19 waiver for the existing members to sign. What if they do not sign it? Can I refuse to let them work out? Yes, yeah, same, same answer as before. As long as your refusal does not look like it's being, um, being based upon some illegal category such as sex, age, and uh, uh, race, uh, yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. I am going to turn it over to Matthew Vizana. I made you a co-host if you want to share your screen. He is with CCS Presentation Systems. Do I have to unshare? Nope, you shouldn't have to. Okay. Well, before I switch that over, uh, Brad, as a business owner, I just want to say I appreciate the information. <laughs> Uh, that you're providing for everybody, because there's a, obviously a lot to take in and a, and a lot to consider. Uh, Elena, how much Thank time you, do we have? Uh, I think we finished a little earlier than we did last week. So how much yep. time do we have? About 15 yeah. minutes? Yeah, okay. if you have five minutes or so, or is that what you said? About 15. 15? <laughs> <laughs> I'll run through stuff quick. All right, so again, Matthew Vizana, CCS Presentation Systems. We're a commercial audiovisual integration firm. Um, national company started with about uh, two employees back in 91, and uh, we cover most of the United States now. So uh, design engineering, equipment sales, installation, uh, training, and ongoing service. And then uh, you can see some of our other offices and national coverage. So from an enterprise deployment, uh, I know we're a small business here, but anybody has other locations we can assist. So some of the things that uh, uh, we're talking about in these um, return to work scenarios, there are some still some work from home considerations that need to be taken into account as well as facility uh, considerations. So how does technology uh, assist in those as you evaluate uh, operations? So Home office upgrades, those are things that companies are now starting to uh, provide enhancements to workers. As we looked at the rush out of our offices uh, when this first started, everybody packed up quickly and raced home. And then I think we've all seen the challenges with uh, home office setups and uh, maybe not as appropriate technology-wise as what we would need to continue to communicate that professional environment to our clients. Um, so a lot of companies now are looking at upgrading those for their employees, providing uh, stipends. So lighting, webcams, um, upgraded microphones and speakers. And then these are things uh, versus the $100 webcams that uh, you can't seem to find on Amazon anymore because everybody's bought them all. But uh, uh, going to an upgraded system. And then these are things that could be taken back into the work environment when we do return to facilities. I think there's going to be a lot more of the huddle room setups because you're not going to be able to shuffle everybody into a large conference room. So just some things to consider. There's some uh, kind of those mid-range uh, kits to upgrade what you have at home for employees. Considerations and places to look at as you evaluate your facility. Employee uh, entrances and exits, do some of those need to be one way? Do we need to eliminate some of those in a larger facility? Uh, what kind of monitoring do I need in those areas? Um, do they need to be separate guest entrances? Uh, and then what pieces do we have in place there? Lunch rooms, lobbies, common areas, shared work areas. Some of the things that companies are starting to look at are camera systems, uh, some of which have uh, artificial intelligence so they can count the number of employees. 
Uh, they can also take a look at uh, distancing requirements or are those employees uh, maintaining proper distances. Uh, so, and then bathrooms, none of which the technology that we sell, but something to consider. Do you have enough no touch scenarios in those uh, environments? And then for larger facilities, obviously elevator, um, elevators are considerations. Probably the thing that we get asked about most currently is our no touch temperature check tablets. Um, nice thing about these is you can do remote monitoring so if i have multiple locations uh, i can monitor multiple locations there are requirements now in regards to taking uh, temperatures on site day of and keeping records all of these systems do tie into full uh, enterprise grade solutions whether it's access control or employee database just a quick uh, video on how that works So that was one example of one of the products that we carry. We do have a couple other offerings depending upon size requirements and network capabilities, um, more of kiosk type setup. So uh, different solutions available in that temperature uh, check tablet category. Why should you invest in them? Um, I think the message that it sends first and foremost to your employees that uh, you care about uh, them and you're putting those proper protocols in place some risk mitigation for you, uh, kind of that first line of uh, defense by providing a, uh, uh, a quick no-touch uh, temperature scan to your protocols. Uh, and then once again, you don't have to hire people to stand there with uh, thermometers and uh, uh, come in close contact to, to other employees. And you can, multi uh, you can monitor multiple devices from a particular area. And then the additional technology options, as we talk about uh, areas, I mentioned the camera systems, but also access control. So we had a uh, client recently with a keypad access control that said, hey, how do I to go to a more no touch where somebody doesn't have to in a, enter in a four digit code. So you have uh, key card swipes, you have uh, uh, key fob swipes, uh, virtual receptionists, uh, uh, those are technology now, so we can move that person back in a lobby area or even put this out into a, uh, uh, a portico before they enter into a facility. Um, automatic doors, those can be tied into access control systems. Um, digital signage communication now, uh, much more important both internally and externally as to what uh, proper protocols are. And because these things are constantly changing, Digital signage gives you a way to immediately have those messages uh, updated. And so uh, digital signage and operations is probably one of our biggest part of our business of late, and we expect it uh, to get even more important. And then digital directories and wayfinding. So maybe taking the person out of a front lobby that would normally direct uh, uh, people and providing uh, systems that they can access just via their cell phones. Uh, to get the updated information as far as uh, uh, directory through facilities. And there's my contact information. We have uh, consultants that uh, on an individual basis can work with you and your facility to, to analyze and look at opportunities from a technology standpoint, how you integrate that, um, 
not only short term with what we're uh, dealing with from a COVID standpoint, uh, but also long term. Um, just a couple of stories of late. So um, the Disney resorts, they just announced that they will be taking somebody, every person that comes in has to go through a temperature scan before they let them into a Disney resort. And then we have a number of fitness facilities and say, oh, this uh, F45 on. We have fitness facilities that uh, they have put in as part of that in their membership guidelines that they will also be testing everyone uh, before they allow to, them to come in and work out. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of my uh, presentation. So if there's any questions, happy to, happy to field those. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, Brad, before I get to clarification of your answer, we have one question for Matthew. Can you share a price point on the Tori Health kiosk? Very cool technology. Yeah, so uh, depending upon how it needs to be deployed, we actually have uh, the good view systems will start about $1,900 and you can go up to about $4,000 for the, uh, the largest tablet in the, uh, the Tori lineup. So kind of a full range, it really is, uh, how do they need to be mounted? Um, do you need them tied into a network? Um, so there's a few different questions that we would take you through in order to give you an exact quote, but it's pretty much the range, about 1,900 to 4,000. Okay, thank you. And Brad, you have an answer, or a clarification, I should say. Well, yeah, answer and clarification. I went and looked at the new order, and it continues the, the protocol from 77, and that is that, and it is a, it is a fine distinction, but it's a distinction nonetheless. The, your customers are under an order from the governor to go into your space when it is a public place with a mask. You, however, are not deputized <laughs> to require them to wear that mask. Uh, in other words, that's, that's a matter for the police. I guess your decision will be at that point. I, I would still think it's a good, pr good practice to offer them a mask if they don't have one. But that's the distinction. They are, they are under orders from the governor when they're in a public place to wear a mask. You are not required to, do, not required to provide that to them. It's just a best practice. I hope that clarifies that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad and Matthew. Brad, do you want to tee us up for next week, maybe? A little... Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, well, of course, barring 10 more executive orders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do well, you think's so up for next week? Clearly, we'll have, uh, clear, clearly we'll have the uh, uh, updates to make. And, and by the way, Matthew, that is a, those are very cool products. And I, I hope to put... Uh, be able to add something and even get some guidance from you on, on the legalities of, of when you can measure and what kind of consent you have to get. And I hope to, that is actually one kind of uh, update I hope to provide as to the consents that are required for that kind of thing when you have a non-employee. Uh, plus we'll have the HIPAA requirements we'll be dealing with. We'll get more into the return to work because hopefully return to work will be more of a, uh, uh, of a, of a topic next week than it is now. So that's what I'm hoping to see. All right. Thank you so much, Brad. We really appreciate your time today and Matthew's time today and everybody's time today. We hope that you are finding this extremely helpful. I know I am. Uh, one of the things, just FYI, that I started doing is I actually took Executive Order uh, 91 and I copied and pasted it into a Word doc. And I am now going through it pretty much line by line, and I'm highlighting what we need to do uh, to get prepared, what we need to put in place, and then I'm actually writing in there who's going to be responsible for doing what, what supplies do we need to get now, you know, so it's going to follow exactly uh, what the executive uh, order states that we need to do, and then I plan on keeping that document, of course, um, and all the other documents that we generate as a result of this so that, you know, we have proof uh, of, of uh, what we've done uh, to protect ourselves, our staff, and our uh, clients too. So to Brad's great suggestion about documentation is one of the most important things we can do right now. So Indeed. thank you everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks.